Okay, so um, like I said, this is going to be sort of like uh, working with a breadboard a little bit in, in the sense that you're going to be soldering to a surface that is only one-sided. The perf board, I'm going to grab one of these over here, only has copper on one side, so you don't have to do any. I'm going to go ahead and put this under the cam here. That very well. You see how it's shiny? Mm -hmm. It's like copper, right? But what I want you to notice here is that each one of those dots is isolated from one another. It's not like, for example, uh, a breadboard where you would have, you know, columns mapping to rows and, and you would be able to just like slap an integrated circuit down in between them, straddling the two sides here, and then having access to the pin via the row. So it's not going to be like that. Um, I do want to go over the minimal circuit that you guys are going to be uh, building, but I think before we get into that we have to go over some safety basics about using these soldering irons. Because in the wrong hands, uh, they can hurt you. So, or worse, you break the soldering iron. Yes, or worse. Or worse, you can break the soldering. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have a uh, plotter over here. So we get some things out of the way. I guess I can move this now. Um, let's see, how do I do this with the camera? This right here is the type of soldering station that you guys are going to be using. Um, it's not the exact one that you're going to use, but this is similar. So inside of this thing, there's a transformer, I'm guessing like what a huge a huge capacitor or something. I don't know. Anyway, but so what it allows you to do is it allows the solder station to heat up really quickly. And it gets really hot. This one I have set to 800 degrees. The ones you're going to be working with are going to be 800 degrees. Um, and there's sort of this cable that leads to your iron. And I think that everybody's comfortable holding a pencil at this point in your school career. Um, those are the next generation, maybe all tablets. So, wouldn't that be weird if that was like a skill that got lost? Like cursive is no longer around, and neither like the people hold a pencil and they're like, "What? What is this?" <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. Um, anyway, so let's see if I can get this stuck. I'll just show the temperature. Eight hundred degrees now, right? And so, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the type of wire that we're using tonight. Is uh, It's not solid core, it's stranded. It's just what we have access to, it's, it's free. And so before you make an attempt to, before you make an attempt to like solder these things into the perf board, uh, I think probably you should tin the tip first. So I'm trying to do this under the camera. So, uh, what is tin the tip? You, you want to get the tip of your wire kind of covered in some solder first. Now there's going to be flux next door, and flux is sort of like Jesus for, for soldering because it, uh, it's sort of, you see how the solder is not really sticking? It's not really wanting to. There's flux in the solder though. There is. It is. This is rosin for solder, I think, right? Probably. Anyway, uh, but that's what that steam is coming out, I believe. It's just the uh, the flux kind of. Don't agree that. Yeah, shortening your life <laughs> by ten years. Anyway, so now that it's it's tin, very badly, I should say, but it is tin. Uh, you don't really have the issue of like uh, plugging it. Well, this one is not going to fit, but. That perf board, for example, like what you're going to be using. Um, now you can sort of get it in here. And uh, 
kind of put it in there and then touch the soldering iron to it and it'll now it's in, you know. So that's I mean like basically what you're doing. And then if you really want to clean it up on the other side, uh, you know, find it. Now that's on, that's sort of what you're going to be doing. And so you're going to be like taking the wire and moving it to like the location that it needs to go to. So like perhaps you need to get from this location all the way back to here at Mega 328, which is the processor that we're going to be using tonight. Really it's a microcontroller. I wouldn't really classify it as a microprocessor. But, um, you know, you can strip the other end of the wire here and then put it on the pin. It's just like using breadboard, you know, except you have to solder. Um, so probably we should uh, just be sure not to, you know, you're going to be working with solder very closely to your hand. Just you know, use common sense. You know, don't burn yourself. Don't touch it. Definitely don't touch it. But anybody that's ever soldered before and used one of these stations before, they've been burned, you know, so it's sort of like a trained reaction. In the process of jerking, you know, when you eventually do burn yourself, you don't like to throw the wand at your buddy and burn his face. That would be bad. Um, so, like, why would you want to do this? Like, why would you want to learn how to build the Arduino from the ground up, from like this, you know, from the chip level up? Um, because really, we want to get away from shields, which is like the way that people get started, they buy their Uno, they buy their shield, they plug it in, they look up an Arduino library, and then they're like, look what I can do, and it's like, you really didn't do anything. You, know, you really didn't do anything that wasn't already, you know, there's nothing innovative about what you've done. So, um, this is gonna be like a three-part class, and I'm gonna show you guys, like, kind of what I've done, and this is sort of going to be the end goal for you know, class three, at the end of it, you are going to be able to make things like this. So, um, these are actually two boards that I made. The one is just this snow LED board, and the other one is like a control board. Um, and it's like a replacement board for an electronic paintball gun. And I say that around here, and everybody's like firearm phobic, and it's really tragic because this is like a really fun project. And so I'm just gonna kind of show you like what you can do with these things. Um, that chip right there, that's the same chip we're gonna be working with tonight, except it's the surface mount version. Uh, the TQFP32 package is what I guess it's called. It fits on your finger now, and it's got 32 pins on it. The version we're using tonight is like this thing, it's a dip 28 version. Um, if you take like a little mill and you mill the center of this chip and you mill the center of that chip, you're going to see an identical like silicon wafer on the inside. Like it's identical. It's just how they pin them out is different. This one's meant for like breadboards and whatnot. So I know we have a ton of people here. We only had 20 kids. And you had to sign in. So it's first come, first serve. So there's going to be useful information here tonight. I know there's some people still walking in, but uh, if we've got 20 people up there, those are the people that are getting kids. Uh, so really partner up too. Yeah, you can partner up, and this will be a learning experience for everyone. So the first thing I want to do is I kind of want to direct your attention to the back of the classroom. Okay. You're going to see on the wall there. I'm going to go back there. I don't know if you want to re-aim the camera. start making this. So the very first thing that you're gonna that you're gonna do is this is your reset pin right here, pin number one. 
We had a connected with a 10k ohm resistor, the DCC. Um, and right here, I think it's pin 9 and pin 10, called X tau 1 and X tau 2. Uh, connect the 16 megahertz crystal between the two pins, and then extending from the two pins, also put a capacitor on each side, and then tie it to the other end of the capacitor. And then you also want to connect the other uh, the pin twenty to pin seven and pin eight to pin twenty two. Uh, it's, I don't know if this is interesting for some people, but on the service mount version of this chip, you don't actually have to connect the VCC to VCC on the side. It's actually connected internally. But on the DIP version, if you take like a, a multimeter to touch them, it's not factored. So, but uh, yeah, you need to go and, and do this as quickly as possible. So if you're, uh, we're going to take a look at the list and see who the first three people were. If you're those people, take a picture using your using your phone or come back and reference. And uh, who's got the list? Should there be a bypass if you have a This is called the minimal circuit. Obviously. And if you haven't signed in, sign in if you could regardless. This would be like a chip right now. David, call out the names for this one to move. I think you two were on the top. Yeah. I'm in next group. Yeah, I'm in the first group to grab a kit. Yep. Okay. There's only uh, three solder stations next door. There will be a fourth one shortly. We asked engineer if yeah, we can use our solder stations. They said no. functions. Um, they're both uh, return type void. Uh, the first one is called void. So, uh, the next one is void. So in order for it to compile, you have to have both of these. So done compiling. It's good to go, right? Alright, so why do you need these two? Well, it, it turns out that, um, I mean, if anybody's ever programmed in C, this is like analogous to having like int main void, and then the return type would be like, I don't know, zero, or the return type would be int, and then you would have like return zero at the bottom of your int main void. Uh, what they did here is they just made it a little easier for people that are getting into programming. Uh, that part where it says setup, that's everything that's in main that is not in the loop. So it would be a good place to declare any uh, any variables, like you know, when you start up in main void, you declare all your variables that are going to be used in main that are not necessarily in a loop. And then the void loop part would be like if you had a while loop in your in main void that was just like while one, and it just keeps running no matter what, it never comes out. Um, so setup is a good place to put any code that is only going to execute once. Uh, and it's also the place where you set up pins. So like, if you want to use pin 8 as an output, then you would have to use a function called pin mode. You can see it's a keyword. It turns orange when you type it. Uh, and then pin mode, and then you specify the pin so I'm using digital pin 8, and you tell it uh, that it's going to be an output. Um, 
So, and then you go down to loop. And what do you want to do with it? Well, we want to blink an LED. So we're going to put uh, digital right. It's a keyword, turns orange. Digital right takes two inputs. Uh, it takes the pin and it takes what you want it to do. So in this case, we're going to say pin eight. We want it to turn high. And then we want to delay for just a second. So delay is also a function. This is in milliseconds. So 1,000 is going to be one second. And then we want to use digital right again. Eight. Low. And then we also have to put a delay at the end. Anybody tell me why we have to put a delay at the end? Yeah, so what's going to happen is this, this loop just keeps going and going and going and going, right? So if we didn't have this bottom delay right here, then, you know, it, it, would, uh, it, it wouldn't know to turn it off for any length of time. It would know to turn it off, but as soon as it gets to this line right here, it goes back up to the top and goes immediately to high. So it would be off for no time at all. So you have to tell it to stay off for at least some time. Um, now I want to talk about the digital write function for a second. Um, it's a nice function because it lets you it lets you turn on and off a particular pin. So like if you want pin eight to turn on and off, um, you can turn pin eight on and off. Um, this is different from other microcontrollers and other pro yeah. What's the uh, comment character? Like, like, oh yeah. Um, two backslash. Same as C. Uh, and the, the backslash star and star backslash if you want to use multi lines. Uh, in other microcontrollers like the MSP430, you have like two ports and a port consists of several pins. And if you want direct port access to a pin, uh, you have to address it differently than we do here. This is so much easier for beginners. Uh, but the, the downside to using the digital, the digital write function is that it actually isn't as simple as it looks on the surface. If you were to look at the source code for the digital write function, you would see that there are lines of code that actually are like a safety net so that people don't use a pin in a way that wasn't meant to be used. Um, and it actually limits how fast you can turn the pin on and off. So it limits how fast you can make it a high or a low signal. Um, and so you can actually get around um, using digital write high or low by uh, using something that they call direct port access, which is essentially you're taking pure C and you're using it inside your uh, Arduino code here. Uh, it's not something you have to learn. You can program fine using digital write. But if you want to do something like toggle between high and low signal very quickly, like I do, then you want to learn how to use direct port access. Uh, the Arduino IDE is cool because you can you can use uh, pure C in it, and you can also from I haven't done it, but I've heard people put assembly language like in in the code here, which I think is pretty cool. And if you want to get like a faster access to the pin, like make it turn on and off faster without having to learn how to use direct port access, there's an Arduino library out there that someone wrote. I think it's called Digital Right Fast. And it's basically, it takes out all those lines of code that are like safety checks to make sure that you're using the pin the way that it's supposed to be used. They just assume that you know how the pin is supposed to be used. Um, so I don't know if you guys know how to uh, include a library. Like, okay, so let's maybe do that. So Arduino has uh, libraries that you can use. So, um, but to get to them, you have to use like your file explorer, and you have to go in your C drive, and then program files x86 is usually where it is. 
Uh, here you can see it says Arduino, so we click it, we go into libraries. And then all these right here, I haven't put any libraries from like GitHub in here. This is Justin's computer, we just put Arduino on here. These are all the libraries that come with it. So I think probably being mechanical engineers, everybody works with servos, right? So we want to, we want to use uh, a servo. And so we got to include the servo library. So we're going to double click this. And inside here, you're going to see if I can find it, servo.h file, right? So in here in your IDE, you have to pound include. And I think it's capital S. Make sure you get your case correct. Servo. That H. Well, let's see if it compiles. All right, so it, it compiled. So we know that we we included the library successfully. And so what this is going to allow us to do now that we have the library included is it's going to give us access to any class definitions and class member functions and data types that are stored within the class. Uh, I guess up the servo. So I don't know if Justin has Visual Studio on his computer here. Probably not because it's not giving me like a little icon over here that says, you know, it's a .h file. But let's go back to examples. So how do we use a servo? Well, probably sweep. You know, you would want the servo arm to sweep, right? So you open up the sweep library or the sweep folder, and you can pull this open. And this is sample code that someone, I guess this guy right here, Marion, whatever. I don't, I don't like looking at comments, so I usually get rid of them. Um, but here I'm going to just go through the code real quick. I know it's commented, but you know maybe there's some questions you guys would have. Does anybody know what a, a class is in C++? Yeah, a, a class, um, do you know what a struct is? You take a C class? Um, a class is different from a struct in that a struct does not allow for member functions, sometimes called methods. I know it, it depends on what language you're talking about. If you're talking Java, they call them methods. If you're talking C++, they're called member functions. But a member function is a function which exists and is used within the class to manipulate uh, data that is within the class. It is a self-contained unit. So whereas in a struct you can say, I want to declare a struct, and I want it to be called book, and book will have pages, and book will have, you know, and the page would be like the, I don't know, numbers, I guess, I don't know, it could be an, an integer array. So it would be like an integer array for, you know, however many pages would be in the book. And then you would have like, uh, maybe like a constant character array, for like uh, chapters or something, I don't know. But a struct is just something that holds primitive data types or any other structs that you may have created. So you can have structs with structs, you can have structs with structs with structs. Um, in the same way you can have classes, and a class differs in that you have all those primitive data types listed within your class, but then you have functions that act on them. And, some, and it actually gets really, do we need something? Anyway, um, so servo is a, it's it's a class definition, and when you create, I guess when you instantiate would be the right word, a class, it becomes an object. So you say, um, servo is the class name. There's a variable called my servo of type a servo and it now is an object. So my servo is now an object. Um, <clears throat> then there's uh, some primitive data types here that are declared globally, only one of them. It's the pause, which I'm guessing stands for position. Uh, it's set to zero and in setup, it looks like there's a, a function called attach and it takes in probably the pin I'm guessing, like the pin that you would attach it to. So you say my servo dot attach, 
in nine. So all the data going to the servo, telling it where to go, like the pulse that's going to it, is traveling through pin nine. So the servo is going to have like power, a ground, and a data, right? Usually how they work? Power, ground, and data? Well, pin nine would be the data part of it. And you would just have to make sure that the servo has its power and ground. Um, and then it looks like in a loop, it is just a, looks like a for loop inside loop. And it just goes from 0 to 180 degrees, and then back. So this would be swinging forward, and then this would be swinging backward. And you can see that every time, uh, I, I guess every degree, it, it delays for 15 milliseconds. So although it looks like a smooth, fluid motion, it's actually just going to different spots along its path and delaying for 15 milliseconds. Um, so this is swing forward and swing backward, and then it loops back up, so it swings forward and backward constantly. Um, probably that's not so interesting, and you would want to have like a push button to actuate it. Like, you know, I want to be able to push a tactile button and have it swing forward, and then maybe I push it again and it swings back. So then you would want to look up maybe how, how do we get the Arduino to do that? So you can, if you're like a first timer, go looking around for code that will allow you to, uh, to do that. But I can show you push button code. And I think it's probably easier to show you in the context of linking an LED before we get into servo. So let's create some variables here. We'll call this, uh, call this, we'll make it a Boolean because it's only going to be a, a zero or a one. That's another thing about programming in general is that you should use like the most primitive data type that you can possibly use. Um, and the reason for this is um, it gets a little complicated. I don't want to overwhelm anyone, but these chips only have a finite amount of RAM. And it's very easy to do what's called a, a, a crash of the stack or a stack crash if your RAM is overwhelmed. So you should always use the most primitive data type available. Like you wouldn't want to use like an unsigned long for what we're going to do here. It's just, it's too much. Uh, you could use an int, it wouldn't hurt. Um, so we're just going to make a Boolean, we'll call it button, see, make it zero. Probably not a bad idea to make another one called retrieve button, see. And they can both be set to zero. Um, and so here in the void loop, what you want to do is you want to first scan using the digital read function the state of the pin that's going to be, uh, first let's go ahead and, and make another pin, let's attach one. This one's gonna be an input, so maybe we do pin nine input. This is actually an important step, I'm sorry I missed it. But yeah, you gotta, you gotta declare a pin that's gonna be an input. And, and then you have to say that button state would be digital read and you're reading pin nine. So this is basically saying, uh, every time it goes through the loop, I want you to read what's happening on pin nine. Is it high or is it low? So now we have to introduce a, a, a control structure. So if button state is not equal to read button state, And button state is high. Execute this code. Then at the very 
very bottom, you're going to set pre button state equal to state. So this double condition right here basically says um, the very first condition where it says button state not equal to previous button state or pre button state, it's basically saying um, compare the two variables, um, previous button state, if you're not touching it, if you're not pressing anything, should be zero and button state should be zero. The minute you push it and it compares, then button state will be high, previous button state will be low. Um, and then when it gets down to the bottom after it blinks the LED, it sets previous button state to high, and then as it goes through back up at the top of the code and scans, you know, the, the input pin nine, you know, if, if your finger has been lifted, then it sets the button state to zero, whereas previous button state is still high. Um, Make it sense really? So I'll show you what it has the effect of doing. So. Let me get some power here. So this is something you can't see, but in a moment will. So here we have our Arduino. This is your at melt chip. Um, over here we have an LED. You see that? You can hardly see it. And here we have our button. So when we pull our button, I have to get this in a way that. So when I push, this is what the effect of the code is. You push the button, it blinks, shuts off. So this, this actually has some more intricate code on it. Um, it's set up to listen in for button inputs. And if you pull, or if you push the button faster than once per second, it blinks three times. And if you pull slower than once a second, then it only blinks once. So I'm going to show you what that helps out. So uh, I'm going to take a minute and go next door and kind of make sure that everybody's on track here. Then I'm going to come back and we'll talk about maybe introducing you guys to the millis function. <laughs>